In this video, we're going to tackle solving equilibrium problems. Equilibrium problems are some of the most difficult quantitative problem solving that we will do in this entire course. It's important to master it because it will reappear in future chapters on other kinds of chemical equilibria. In this video, we'll try to connect how we would approach and ultimately solve these problems. And then towards the end, we'll actually do some example problems so you can see how these examples are worked through in detail. So I've provided a flow chart for how you might begin solving these types of problems. And normally the answer that the problem is seeking is here in this last box, and it is the concentration of the reactants and products at equilibrium. And so normally what you're given in a problem is a chemical equation and also the starting conditions. What are the initial amounts of specific reactants or products? So from this initial point, you then want to determine which direction will the reaction proceed? Will it be towards products or will it be towards reactants? And then that determines the direction of the change, but not the amount of the change. So the change is as this reaction progresses to equilibrium. And we want to determine how much each reactant and product changes so that when it reaches equilibrium, ultimately we'll have those final concentrations. So here's a visual illustration of what this type of problem might look like. So we're given a chemical equation here. Two molecules of A turns into one molecule of B. And we're given the equilibrium constant for this reaction, which is represented by this image here. This set of images represents a continuum of possible Q values. Remember Q is the reaction quotient, and it can range from zero to infinity, and the reaction can proceed from any of these starting points, but will always stop at equilibrium when Q is equal to K. We know that the equilibrium here is when Q equals K, and this is when the reaction will come to a rest. The net concentrations will stop changing. So let's say the problem starts initially with all A. So this would be our starting point. And because we only have reactants, the natural progression then for the reaction direction is towards products. So the reaction would proceed to B or to the right. So we expect the change in the direction towards B. Now the amount of the change is going to be called this variable X. And X is important because it's the unknown amount that we need to solve for. So in this reaction equation, two molecules of A converts to one molecule of B. So as we lose reactant, we're going to lose reactants in a 2 to 1 ratio to product formation. So A will decrease by 2x, but B will increase by 1x, all the way up until equilibrium. Now we can have a different version of this problem where it's the same chemical reaction and equilibrium constant, but now we've changed our initial starting point. So let's say I start at this far end with 100% B. So now the reaction direction is going to proceed towards the left or towards A. And so in that direction, Q can reach K, and there the reaction will stop. So here again, we will change by an amount X. But now we are building reactant, so A will now increase by 2X, and B will decrease 
by X. This is a more general chemical reaction where A turns into D with some equilibrium constant K. And here the coefficients in the balance equation are kept unspecified. Um, they're just denoted with lowercase a or d. The heavy lifting in solving equilibrium problems is usually right in the middle here. What is the amount of change? And so a big part is solving for the amount of change or x. And typically that value of x is strongly linked to the value of the equilibrium constant k. Once you have x, determining the final concentrations of reactant and products at equilibrium is really just using these straightforward equations where the equilibrium concentrations firstly depend on the initial concentrations plus or minus the change amount x multiplied by the coefficient in the balanced equation. And so here you might notice that the signs here are opposite between A and D. And this should make sense because if the reaction is proceeding to D, then A should decrease while D increases. And you'll naturally see this type of opposing signs for reactants and products. Now we're ready to solve some problems. Here's an example problem where the chemical reaction is carbon monoxide, CO, plus water gives us carbon dioxide, CO2, plus hydrogen. And this reaction has an equilibrium constant value of 1.56 at 900 Kelvin. So the problem states that 0 0.250 moles of CO and 0 0.500 moles of water are placed in a 125 milliliter flask at 900 Kelvin. What is the composition of the equilibrium mixture? So here's our flow chart where we have initial moving through change to equilibrium. And you can see that the question is asking for the equilibrium concentrations of all the reactants and products. So initially, uh, we have CO and water present and no products. And so we have non-zero concentration of CO and water that are listed here. And because these are both reactants, it makes sense that then the reaction direction should be towards products. So this arrow means that the reaction will proceed to the right two products. Now in deciding the change amounts, that's the unknown. And so we'll use the variable x. And the balance equation is nice because all the coefficients are one. So the reactant CO and water will disappear by an x amount while the products will form by x amount. So mathematically, the change would be minus x for our reactants or plus x for our products. This allows us to write equilibrium concentrations as a function of x. So I just list two as an example, CO for a reactant and CO2 for a product. The CO then is just the concentration initially minus x. And since we start with no products in this um, initial condition, CO2 concentration at equilibrium will just be equal to x. So how do we solve for this unknown variable x? This is where the Kc value is helpful because we know that Kc is a certain value that's given to us. And we also know how to write Kc expressions where our products are in the numerator and our reactants are in the denominator. And if we simply plug these expressions in, we come up with a way of just solving for x. In all of this, we need concentrations because this is what appears in the equilibrium expression. And so one important thing is to take these values 
and solve for concentration if they're not explicitly given. So we're given moles and we're given volume and moles over volume gives you concentration. So here the CO is initially 2.00 molar and water initially is 4.00 molar. The flow diagram can be a bit clunky, so I'm going to replace it with something called an ICE chart. I stands for initial, C stands for change, and E stands for equilibrium. The ICE chart is also a great way of organizing all the numbers that you need to keep track of. So here's the chemical reaction again, and the equilibrium constant, and I for initial, we only had the reactants present in two and four molar and no products, so these are zero. The reaction proceeds to the right, two products, and so the reactants will decrease by minus x, but the products will increase by plus x. And remember that the minus one and plus one is really because all the balance coefficients in this reaction are one. Now that we have the first two rows in our IC chart, the third row equilibrium is really just a sum of the top two entries. And so if you add initial to change, then what you get is the concentration at equilibrium. And so at equilibrium, here are the expressions for our reactant concentrations. And our two product concentrations are both going to be equal to x. Now we're ready to solve for x using Kc. So here is the Kc expression for this equation again, and we know that's equal to 1.56. Now what we're going to do is we're going to replace each of these concentration terms with these expressions. And so in the numerator here, these are the concentrations of our product at equilibrium. And since they're both equal to x, our numerator becomes x squared. In the denominator, these are the concentrations of our reactants, which are here and here. And so we have these both terms down here below. So now we're going to start simplifying this equation. The first thing I'm going to do is factor that denominator out. And then I'm going to multiply both sides by this large denominator. Okay. And then I'm going to multiply through the 1.56 into this term in parentheses and collect all my terms on one side. That will give me an equation where I have zero on one side and all my terms on the other side. I have a term in, in, with respect to x squared, another term with respect to x, and lastly a third term that's just simply a constant. And this may remind you of the quadratic equation. And we can solve for x using this quadratic formula. And the way to use it is to first set up your quadratic equation in this form, where you have ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. So here's my 0. My a will be 0 0.56. My b term will be minus 9.36 and my c term is 12.5 and so I plug these values of a, b, and c into this expression below and I can solve for x. The quadratic formula will lead to two values of x. Now only one of these values is actually real and it makes sense that the real one would be 1.46 because our initial concentration, the highest, is only 4. So we can't change by 15 molar. So 1.46 is the correct answer for x. But we're looking for the concentration of reactants and products at equilibrium. So that's easy. We just plug in the 1.46 as x into these prior equilibrium expressions. And we find that at equilibrium, this is the composition of the mixture. We have every species present, um, the reactant CO at 0 0.54 molar, water at 2.54 molar, and both products CO2 and hydrogen 
are in equal concentration at 1.46 molar. A word of caution about using the quadratic formula. Take your time to plug in your terms A, B, and C uh, to get the correct answer for X. I don't know about you, but oftentimes when I'm rushing through the quadratic formula, it's very easy to make a mistake with a sign and get the wrong answer. So I'd like to show you two cases where you can skip using the quadratic formula and solve for x much more simply. These cases arise when your equilibrium constant is either extremely small or extremely large. So here's an example where our equilibrium constant is extremely small. And the tell sign here is this magnitude. This value is 10 to the minus 10. So this is a chemical reaction where iodine, I2, basically breaks apart into two individual iodine atoms. And the problem states 0 0.50 moles of iodine was heated in a 2.5 liter vessel. The above reaction occurred. Calculate the concentrations at equilibrium at 600 kelvins. So like before, here's our flow chart that we're going to use to set up this problem. And initially, all we have is iodine. And we're given that in terms of mole and volume, but we can do a simple math and calculate that the initial concentration is 0 0.2 molar. And again, this is a straightforward case that we start with only reactants. So there's only one direction for this reaction to go, and that is to the right. Now, the one thing I will note though, because K is so small, this directionality to right is actually just a very small change in X. So yes, it proceeds right, but only by a very small amount. And this is what I meant when the value of X is strongly tied to the value of K. Just like before, X still represents that amount of change. And we can use the coefficients in this balance reaction, which is one and two. So minus X for iodine plus two X for the product iodine atom. And then we can write expressions for their equilibrium concentrations. Iodine will be equal to the initial amount minus X and and the iodine atom amount will be plus x at equilibrium. Now, because k is so small, which means that x is very small, we can add a simplification to this equilibrium expression here on top. If x is so tiny and you subtract it from a reasonably much larger number, like the initial concentration, then really you don't feel a difference that the amount of I2 left is basically the same as what you started with. One analogy I can give for why the simplification works is to use money. Let's say you own a $1.0 billion industry, okay? And let's say that you buy um, a $2 toothbrush at the store. If you think about $1.0 billion, that's one times 10 to the ninth. And you're going to subtract two from one times 10 to the ninth. In the end, your net worth is still $1.0 billion or one times 10 to the ninth um, amount. So you can ignore the loss of that really measly $2. Um, you cannot unfortunately do that for the product concentration because even though X is a very, very small value, you still have to report it because it's not zero. In the last step here, we can use the KC expression to plug in these values and solve for X. We'll continue solving this problem using the ICE chart. So here's our chemical equation where we have the reaction on top 
and the initial change in equilibrium rows below. So we start with 0 0.2 molar of I2 and 0 molar of I. And the change has to be towards the right because we have only reactants and no products. Now, the change is going to be very small because K value is 10 to the minus 10. But that amount is still represented by X. So for the reactant, it would be minus X and the product would be plus 2X. And that 2 comes from the fact that there is a 2 in front of the product in the balanced equation. The equilibrium concentration is just a sum of these top two entries, initial plus change. And so we can write that the equilibrium, the concentration of I2 would be 0 0.2 minus x, and for I, it would be 2x. Now, I made a simplification here, knowing that x is extremely small. So I can drop the x and just rewrite the equilibrium concentration of I2 as simply 0 0.2. When you make such an important assumption that you can remove x, normally what you want to do is you want to go through the problem, and once you solve for the value of x, you want to plug it back in into this expression here and make sure that indeed x was so small that it was insignificant to this significant figure of 0 0.2. So with these expressions, I can now solve for x using Kc. So Kc is equal to I squared divided by the concentration of I2. And I can plug in for my numerator 2x, and that is all squared. And my denominator is 0 0.2, and I can set that equal to the Kc value of 2.94 times 10 to the minus 10. Now you can see this is a much simpler mathematical equation to solve for x. I can simplify the left side. First I'll make the numerator 4x squared, and then I'll divide 4 divided by 0 0.2, and that will give me 20x squared equals the Kc value. And then I can divide by 20, take the square root of that, and I will get a value for x which is 3.8 times 10 to the minus 6. And you can see this goes much faster and no quadratic formula was needed. With this value of x, you just want to double check that indeed the assumption we made early on was a good one. And so if you take 0 0.2 minus 3.8 times 10 to the minus 6, indeed, with insignificant figure error, that answer is 0 0.2. So the assumption is good and it checks out. So we can now give our answers for the equilibrium concentrations for I2, that's just 0 0.2. And then for the product iodine atom, this is equal to 2x. So 2 times 3.8 times 10 to the minus 6 is this answer here. Now the second case where you can avoid using the quadratic formula is if we're at the other extreme where K, the equilibrium constant is an extremely large value. I generalized that last problem. We still have the same initial, but I just made these generic A reactant and B product, but it's still the one to two ratio. And I've also changed the Kc value here. And this 10 to the five um, magnitude is really what clues us in that this is now an extremely large number. So what does that mean when K is so large? Well, we know from before that that means the reaction is strongly favored towards products. And in this context, that means that the change X will be as large as physically possible. And basically, this reaction A to 2B will form product with 100% conversion. So coming back to this row where we have our equilibrium expression, if X is as large as physically possible, the largest value of X is really limited by how much A we begin with. So the largest 
value that x can be is 0 0.2. And because this equation is 1a to 2b, then we're going to be able to multiply 2 times the largest value, which is 0 0.2, and get that the final concentration of b will be 0 0.4 within the error of the significant figure. But what about reactant A? It is true that if X is as large as physically possible, the concentration of A will be close to zero. But within significant figures, we still need to figure out what that very small number is. So we can solve for X, again, using the KC expression where we have our product squared divided by our reactant, and we can populate this expression with 0 0.4 for the product, which is squared, divided by the reactant concentration, 0 0.2 minus x, and set that equal to this new Kc value. Again, this is a nice expression in that it's more straightforward to solve for x. I'm going to basically rearrange this equation such that I collect all the constants to the left and my variable with x to the right. And further simplification will give me that x is equal to 0 0.2 minus this term here. And plugging that into the calculator, I get that x is equal to 0 0.1 nine 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 four five indeed you can see this is quite close to the value of 0.2 and again i do not need a quadratic formula which is great so at equilibrium the value for the product b is 0 0.4 that was a safe assumption and for the value of a if I subtract 0 0.2 minus this number, I get that it's 5.4 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. So in summing up when you can make a fast approximation, it really depends on your value of K, but also on your initial concentration values. Typically, if you have a greater than 10 to the third factor difference. It can be K is greater than your initial concentration by 10 to the third, or it could be the opposite, where your initial concentration is greater than K by 10 to the third. Then you can make some type of approximation where you can basically um, assume that X is essentially zero or as large as physically possible.